This is the Paula principle. Most women work below their level of competence. Uh, I am an aging bloke talking about futures of younger women, but also younger men, and actually people in the working population generally. But I'm not going to preach. I'm really just putting some questions to you about what I think are some interesting and significant issues. This was the inspiration for the Paula principle, Peter, Paula. But Peter was actually a professor, Peter, Lawrence Peter. And uh, his book, The Peter Principle, sold four million copies, if only. Um, <laughs> that was his principle. You do a job, you do a job well, so you're promoted. You do that job well, so you're promoted again, until you're in a job that you don't do well, and that's where you stick. And he really looked around a lot of organizations. I think one of the reasons his book did so well is that so many people worked in organizations, and they look, I'm not saying this is one of them, but they looked around them uh, upstairs and saw quite a few people at superior levels who seemed to exemplify his <laughs> principle. Um, writing in the 60s, his was, was the human race, because that's generally how people refer, but in any case, in those days, not many women had careers. You'll have to excuse him for it. And the Paula principle is simply the mirror image of the Peter principle. Most women work below their level of competence. But let's go back uh, just a little bit uh, to where this starts, because the origins of this, for me, are the enormous tide of educational achievement by girls and women. Some of you may recognize this quote. It comes from George Eliot, Mill on the Floss, Mill on the Floss. and it's Mr. Tulliver, who has two children, Tom and Maggie. And this is about Maggie. Now, Mr. Tulliver is not a crusty old dad. Mr. Tulliver actually is really fond of both of his children, Maggie as well as Tom. But, 19th century, not much educational opportunity for girls. I'm not quite sure how much a long-tailed sheep was worth then, but at any rate, education was not much good for women then. If we move on now, these are what I call the key crossover points. This is as the tide has moved on. So it's been going for a while, this. 1989, more girls getting two A-levels than boys. 1994, more women in higher education than men. 2001, already at postgraduate level. And the remar this is a remarkably universal trend in all developed countries, all OECD countries, at all levels and in almost every subject. Maths, physics, engineering, computing, and interesting enough, philosophy doesn't seem to happen, but it's a really remarkable trend. Now, I use the image of tide. Actually, tide is not quite the right image because tides go come in, but then they go out again. This tide is carrying on, shows no signs of stopping. So this is the first question, why? I'm not going to answer it. The first time I ever talked about the Paula Principle in public happened to be in Vienna, uh, home of Sigmund Freud. So I did actually ask this question, and quite interestingly, of course, the first person who stood up, or put up a hand to answer it, said, well, of course, I'm not going to do a Viennese accent, although my father was Viennese, of course, it's because girls want to obey figures of authority. So they want to please their teachers more than boys do. Anyway, that was a good Freudian answer. Uh, you, you, may, you may have your own other views on it, and we come back to the end. I'm not going to do any more, but they do, and it's an interesting question, I think. So on the one hand, you've got this extraordinary educational flow. And it's not just in the initial phase. It's not just school college, university, it carries on throughout life. Adult women take part more in adult education and even in vocational training. So they go on adding to what the competence gap uh, on the one side. But on the other side, it's a very different story. So here's a really boring academic type uh, chart. The interesting thing is not just that the dark green figures, which are male earnings, are significantly higher than the grey ones, although that is pretty significant, but as many of you can see, the male figures go on rising till 45, 49, 50, 54 is only when it turns down. And look at the grey figures, 
earlier peak, longer decline. Apologies if that sounds pessimistic. I don't think it's going to carry on happening, but that's the picture at the moment. Now, I should make it clear at this point, I don't think education is all about earnings. I don't think it's all about careers even, although the career side, professional fulfillment, is important. But I'm just looking mainly at this material aspect of the returns to education. So that is the picture. We've got a rising educational tide on the one hand. It just doesn't show up in the workplace as you might expect. And for me, that poses some really interesting questions about what we mean by equality, what we mean by merit, how should merit be rewarded, and so on. Now, let me say, I am not a 50-50 equality person, except in very uh, exceptional circumstances. I actually don't think you've got men over there as one group, women over there as a totally different group. Biologically, most of the population divides into one or other of those categories. For the rest, it's overlaps and it's a distributional issue, in spite of the fact I'm talking about gender as a dividing line. But the equality issue is much more complex for me, much more interesting, if you don't think about it in 50-50 terms. How does it play out in your context, your organisation, the workplaces you are in or you find yourself in? Well, I don't have many answers, but quite useful to think about this in terms of some images. The glass ceiling is an image a lot of you will be familiar with. But the problem is often, and I've, I've interviewed quite a few women uh, in, in writing this book, uh, and they say, glass ceiling has nothing to do with me. That's about people at the top. Now, I know in this uh, august audience here, uh, all of you are shooting towards the top. But the glass ceiling actually is relatively restricted as an image. Think about the sticky floor. For a lot of women, it's actually getting their feet off the floor in the first place, moving up uh, off the floor and getting into positions that they maybe deserve and are competent for. Or should we think about the leaky pipe? Lots of women uh, are into careers. If you take biological sciences, I think it's something like 70% of, of biological science graduates are women. Many of them go into careers, they get PhDs, but if you look at the pattern, at every stage, there's uh, a considerable leakage from that pipe. Or is it just that careers, I've said futures here, but careers, future work is just, it's complex. And in fact, that is one of the things I want to suggest, that we shouldn't think of careers or as our future work <coughs> patterns as a simple vertical ladder to be scaled. So, uh, what explains this? Why do we have the Pauler Principle? Why is there this gap? And I want just to put a little question to you. You're not going to go for the answer. I'm giving you all 100 points, and I'm putting up five factors here, five factors, not particularly original explanations, but they're ones that I think account for why the Pauler Principle uh, is in operation. I want you, mentally, to think, how would I allocate my 100 points across these five factors? So if you think one factor is absolutely explains everything, it's 100, 0, 0, 0, 0. Uh, if you think it's more equal, then it might be 20, 40, 20, 20, 0. Uh, rough maths. So bear that in mind as I go through. So here's, here are the five factors. Discrimination. Probably there's less overt discrimination now, but covert discrimination, that rather subtler forms, yes, still exists, I think, undoubtedly. <coughs> Structural. Child care, possibly increasingly elder care. In this country, in the UK, child care, very expensive by European standards, probably the most expensive of all. So a real interrupting factor. Elder care increasingly, as I tell my daughters, this is going to be a major responsibility. <laughs> uh, psychology, self-confidence. So I think of the 60-20 rule. If men think they can do 60% of a job, that's it, fine, I can do it, I'll go for it. If women think they cannot do 20% of a job, oh, I couldn't do that, no, I don't think I'd better go for that. 
Same is true of promotions and so on. So there's a lack of that willingness to put themselves forward. And I'm sure after today uh, that will be um, look rather differently uh, for the people in this room. But it, it's, it's something that comes up again and again if you talk to them. Fourth is vertical networks. So that's simply knowing people who operate at levels above you, whether it's in the organisation you work in or just generally knowing people who are already whatever professional capacity, whether lawyers, doctors or, or uh, chief senior executives. It's just having those kinds of contacts so you learn the language, you learn to walk the walk and so on. Okay. So those are four, and they, in my book, are all negative factors. So I guess most of us would want to reduce those factors. The fifth is very different. Positive choice. And I say positive choice. This is not the kind of choice uh, of a woman who says, life will be hell at home. If I take this job, it means being away at weekends or working late. Life would be hell at home, so I don't think I can do it. That's not a choice. I mean by a positive choice, Someone who says, oh no, in this case a woman who says, right, I could get that job, but I'm doing a job I think I'm good at. It stretches me, so I'm not just going through the same things again. I'm still learning in it. I don't need the money. I don't need the status. I'm not going to go for that upper job. And for me, that's almost the most interesting. I don't say it's the most important. I say it's one of the most interesting of the explanations. So, how would you allocate your 100 points? Just think about it, take it away, talk amongst yourselves, and I'll just finish with the future, since you are, well, you didn't ask, but I'm gonna tell you. <laughs> um, and I want to say, actually, for me, increasingly, as I've, as I've sort of got into thinking about this, this is, is as much about men and boys as it is about women and girls. So the first is choose for yourself. If you don't want to go up that rung in that particular ladder, you don't have to. But you can, and you've had wonderful examples today, you can go sideways, you can go diagonally, you can go downwards if you want for a bit. Make your choices and you'll be choosing again throughout your lives because working lives are going to get longer and longer. Second is look after others as well as yourself. That's not as preachy as it sounds. I don't mean that as a sort of general moral position, but actually as a career matter. Your career is about other people as well as yourself. And it's a genuine belief on my part that your career will flourish uh, if you look after others as well as yourself. There was a great phrase I heard in a parliamentary select committee that hell has a special place reserved for women who don't help other women. Well, that may or may not be true, uh, and it actually, I think, it just applies to us as humans uh, uh, and not <coughs> one particular thing. And then lastly, keep on learning. It's worth it. It may not bring you the material <coughs> rewards, but it's worth it. I would say that, wouldn't I? Because I've worked most of my life in adult education, but it's true. <laughs> Thank you very much.